जी अस्सलाम वालेकुम एंड गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरीवन लेट्स स्टार्ट लेट्स स्टार्ट आवर फर्स्ट लेक्चर सो एज यू नो इन द ऑनलाइन डिजिटल रियालम देर आर न्यू ट्रिक्स एंड न्यू टेक्निक्स दैट वी ऑल हैव टू लर्न एंड आई एम आल्सो न्यू टू दिस लाइक एनीवन एल्स बट आई ट्राई माय बेस्ट सो प्लीज एक्सक्यूज मी in advance if there are any glitches technical glitches or you find my responses a bit slow so i would like to first of all uh, start my lecture uh, and uh, let me share my screen so here i am all right so today we going to talk about some of the very basic ingredients of crystal structure so it's our first lecture and i would like to talk today about the concept of symmetry as far as it applies to condensed matter systems uh and the uh now symmetry is a very wide concept in physics and all of science and the the way in which we are dealing with symmetry is specific to crystalline systems so symmetry as a concept in different kinds of objects and geometrical patterns has fascinated human beings since time immemorial so for example if you were to look at this pattern here this pattern is a persian tile it's a mosaic from a persian geometric inscription now on this tile you will find lots of symmetrical elements and the goal of the study of symmetry is to assign mathematical formula and mathematical transformations to these to describe these symmetry operations so this object has some symmetry hidden in it how do we describe this symmetry mathematically or conceptually so this is the goal of today's lecture so what we're going to talk about today are basically symmetry elements and these are at the heart of crystalline structure and there are three kinds of elements that generally we encounter we can have points we can have planes and we can have lines or axes so let i'm going to describe what is meant by a point symmetry element or a plane symmetry element or an axial symmetry element but in order to describe these symmetry elements first of all we have to talk about three kinds of objects one i would call points the other i call polygons and the third object i would classify as patterns lots of p's here by the way points polygons patterns so we would like to see how symmetry elements fit into these three kinds of objects so everything is going to become clearer in a minute first of all a point what is a point a point is just a place holder another p by the way so a point is a place holder you put objects on two points so let me draw an array of points here so it's a two dimensional array of points looks like a square array of points now this is a sequence of points a periodic arrangement of points in condensed matter physics these points 
uh, and a periodic sequence of them is called a lattice. The points do not have any structure of their own. They are zero dimensional. They do not have any size. They do not have any form, any texture, any shape whatsoever. They are just identifiers in space. And you put objects on, on, onto the lattice. So those objects generally in, in the jargon of crystallography or condensed matter physics, those objects, they are called, either they are called bases or motifs. So let me just choose a particular object, a triangle. Now, when I draw this triangle, this triangle has a shape, it has a form, it has an orientation. So I can take this basis or motif and put it on each point. So if I were to take this motif, I can place it on each point in an identical fashion, perfectly identical fashion. So I don't change the orientation of the basis as I stud it onto the points. And the way I stud each basis onto each point is also identical. Now what I've generated from this combination of a lattice, which is a sequence of points and a particular geometric basis or motif is a pattern. This becomes a pattern. So a combination of a lattice and a basis becomes a pattern. And in crystallography, these patterns are called crystals. So a crystal is some function of a lattice and a basis. The basis, by the way, could be more complicated. For example, if I were to take a triangle and a square as my basis and the lattice remains the same. So I still have a square lattice or a rectangular lattice and I take this, this basis element and position it in an identical fashion onto each lattice point, I will generate a two-dimensional crystal. So I have a plane or a two-dimensional crystal here. Now this function that we would like to uh, mathematically describe, which is a combination of a lattice and a basis, in the jargon of mathematics, this is called a convolution function. So how do we define a convolution? Has anyone ever come across the convolution function? You could write in the chat box or just raise your hand or just speak up. Have you ever seen a convolution function? If I have two functions, do you know what does this correspond to mathematically? Yes, Ghazi, can you speak up please? Uh, I came across convolution in electrical engineering. It's a very fundamental concept over there. It's uh, the idea is when an input signal uh, transforms into the output signal through the convolution function. Uh, it is a, um, uh, intuitively it's like crossing one function, uh, keeping one function constant and crossing the other function, like moving it linearly across the function. And that produces the product. All right, so if I have a function f, which is some function of space, so this could be our lattice. So if I were to take a sequence of points, for example, a one dimensional lattice, this of course is described by a function. The function in this case will be a sequence of Dirac delta points r minus a n where A is this vector, it tells us the spacing between the points and N is an integer 
and you sum up over all n's from minus infinity to plus infinity and n remains an integer. So this function here is a sequence of peaks which only exist at these points. So this mathematical function describes a one dimensional function. Likewise, we can define two dimensional lattices and three dimensional lattices in the same fashion. So we have a, we have a mathematical description of a lattice. And we can also have a mathematical description for our basis. So suppose this is our basis, GR. So the basis could be a triangle, as I mentioned earlier. It could be any geometrical pattern that we want to put onto the lattice. It could be an atom as well. That's what we have in crystals. In crystals, the basis is a combination of atoms. So now we would like to come up with the convolution function that takes these basis atoms and places them one by one, one by one, one by one, samples them onto the lattice points. The mathematical process by which this is achieved is convolution, which is defined in the following fashion. So I have a function f and a function g, and I would like to take the convolution of these functions. Convolution is denoted by an asterisk, which is surrounded by a circle. And this is given by, it is defined in the following fashion, f of r prime, some dummy variable, g of minus r prime and some running variable r you integrate over r over all r so this is how we define the convolution function now uh, in order to simplify things or to give you an example and i'll probably give one uh, idea uh, to, to bring home the idea of convolution i'll probably give uh, a homework problem suppose i have a function that looks like this this is my f, it's a function of r. And since I'm talking in one dimension, so let's make this r x equal to x. And I have another function, g, which is also uh, like, a, like a square or a gate function or, a, or just a pulse. Now, how do I find out the convolution of these functions? Uh, I just, I don't do anything to the first function. It just remains what it is. The other function I have to invert because this r is replaced by a, by a minus r prime. So I just invert this function. I relabel the, I can always relabel axis as x and x prime. So this becomes my g of minus x prime. This is x prime. This is my f. And then what I need to do, I need to introduce another variable, a running variable. And I sweep this running variable from minus infinity to plus infinity. Now what this running variable does, if I were to add an x over here, what would this running variable do? It would translate g. And it would translate g from minus infinity to plus infinity. So if x were minus infinity, this function would go would go to the extreme left and as x goes up this function is swept to the right step by step okay so as x goes up, this function g, x minus x prime is basically being swept from left to right. And on each step, you have to multiply the original function f with the swept function. And you, you do a point by point multiplication and the multiplication only, uh, so if this function g slightly touches, goes across this origin, then it comes in contact with f and the multiplication becomes non-negative or non-zero between f and g. Finally, when you do a multiplication, you will get a triangular function of this kind. So convolution is basically invert, 
you invert one function here you go then you sweep the function here you go and then you multiply sorry you multiply and then you sweep you invert you multiply and then you sweep in fact you invert Translate, multiply, and then sweep. So the effect of convolution is to take a motif, a basis, and to stud it onto the lattice points. This is how you generate a crystal. So a crystal is basically a convolution between a lattice function and a basis function. So we've talked about points or lattices. Sorry. <clears throat> we've talked about patterns, which are, <laughs> which is just an easy way of saying a crystal. And remember, people often miss construe the term lattice and they talk about sodium chloride lattice or zinc blend lattice or fluorite lattice or diamond lattice. Lattice, by the way, does not have any reference to the atoms whatsoever or the basis or the motif is dissociated from the points. Lattice is just a geometrical array of placeholders and it has certain properties. It has to be periodic and so on. And we're going to define it properly in the next class. But then you put motifs on side the lattice, you generate a crystal or a pattern. All right, so we really have to be careful in the usage of the term lattice. So the third thing, of course, we all know what polygons are. So we could have squares, we could have triangles, we could have circles, we could have hexagons, pentagons, and so on. Yes, Heather, you wanted to ask a question. Uh, yes, sir. So what if we take a large enough point of view where the atoms are still visible, but they are, they are, they appear as some points. Can we call them, uh, can we call this structure a metallic lattice or something? No, not at all. A lattice is just an array of points. It's a geometrical concept, an abstract concept. It defines the underlying placeholders. Where do atoms reside? You, you can have an atom not residing on a lattice, on a lattice point, but displaced to a, with respect to a lattice point. So suppose I have this oblique lattice of this kind. So I'm focusing on two dimensions because two dimensions are easy to understand. And my motif is a starfish. Okay. Now I would like to take the convolution of this lattice with the starfish. So what I would do, I would take the starfish, this thing here, and sweep it on, on this two-dimensional plane. And when I sweep it, only those areas light up where there is an overlap between the starfish and the lattice point. So I could place the starfish here. The result of the convolution is placing the starfish here, here. Here, okay, and then you generate a, a crystal or a crystal of starfishes or a pattern of starfishes. Okay, so the lattice is the underlying template onto which atoms come and sit. The, now the atoms could be one atom, it could be a molecule, it could be a combination of atoms, uh, it could be a group of atoms, Th that is besides the point. And once you have convolved the lattice with the basis or the motif, you have generated a crystal. Okay, now what we would like to do is, we would like to see the impact of symmetry elements on points, planes, Oh, sorry, on points, polygons, and patterns. All right, so, but first of all, let me start with, so 
the symmetry elements which are called axes or lines. And let me state up front that there are of five kinds. There are five kinds of axial symmetry elements and they have certain symbols. One, two, three, four, and six. And we're focusing our attention at the moment to two dimensions. So we live in a two-dimensional flat world, okay? So we, we might be talking about two-dimensional crystals here. But the concept easily carries over to three dimensions. So now these symmetry elements, so th these are not just numbers, these are symmetry elements. So I just like to make them a bit, bo a bit bolder, okay? So they're not simply elements, they are symbols of elements. They are not numbers, they are symbols of elements. And there is also a symbol for each one of these elements. One is, there's no symbol for one. One is just one. Two is generally represented by a pear shape. Three is represented by a triangle, a filled triangle. Four is represented by a filled square. And six is represented by a filled hexagon. And since they, sometimes, sometimes, since they are axial elements, you put an axis as well, but that's optional. Now, this notation for symmetry elements follows what is called the international notation. Or it's also called the Schoenflies notation. Another notation is called the Herman Manguin notation or the HN notation. And in this notation, the elements are represented as these symmetry elements are represented as E, C2, C3, C4, and C6. But we'll stick to the international notation, which is the prescribed notation by the International Union for Crystallography. So what, what, do these, uh, what do these symmetry elements mean and what are the symmetry operations associated with them? By the way, the symmetry operations associated with these symmetry elements are also represented by the same notation, one, two, three, four, six. Now, what are these symmetry operations? Let's see. Uh, by the way, if you studied group theory, if anyone of you has studied group theory, you will recognize, you might recognize these symbols. Anyway, that's besides the point. So let me just show you. Okay. All right, so if I were to draw a square, let's first draw a rectangle. Now the rectangle is a polygon. I could also draw a lattice or a sequence of points, a rectangular lattice. Now let's focus on the rectangle, the polygon lattice and let's in our concept, in our minds label, these vertices as A, B, C, D. Now, if I were to put an axis of rotation, this element, this polygon has a certain symmetry associated with it. And we're just focusing our attention on the axial symmetry elements. There is a twofold axis of rotation that passes through the middle of this rectangle and it comes out. So, and the symbol for this symmetry element, of course, is the pear shape. So this is a two-fold rotation axis. So what this two-fold rotation axis does is that it takes, it rotates this entire polygon by two pi over two. So if, I'm, if I want to talk about an n-fold axis of rotation where n could be one, two, three, four, six, an n-fold rotation, rotates a pattern or a polygon or a, or a sequence of points by 2 pi n or 360 degrees by n. 
So a two-fold rotation exists at the center, geometrical center of this rectangle because if I were to rotate this rectangle by 180 degrees, this A would land up here, this C would land up here, this D would land up here, and this B would land up here. This is what the C, this is what a two-fold rotation would do. So after this rotation is complete, I will still have the same object, the same polygon. So if I were to give you this polygon and I did a two-fold rotation about the geometric center, and while I was doing this rotation, I asked you to close your eyes and then you open your eyes, you wouldn't have, you can't tell whether I've done this rotation or not. This is what is meant by a symmetry operation. So the symmetry operation is a two-fold rotation here. And the symmetry element, which defines this symmetry operation, is also a two-fold rotation axis located at the geometric center of the rectangle. Okay. Now, I could do the same for this sequence of points. If I were to rotate, rotate this entire grid of points by 180 degrees, the pattern will remain, or the pattern or the lattice will remain indistinguishable. So, this is a two-fold axis of rotation. However, uh, if I were to take a square, then the square is has a four-fold axis of rotation passing through the center. Okay, so this is an axial rotation. I can define an axis which is perpendicular to the plane of the square and it comes out of the screen here and I would I could do a 2 pi over 4, which is a 90 degree rotation. And the square remains indistinguishable from the original self. In fact, this rotation, this fourfold rotation is the, if I were to do this fourfold rotation twice, which means I write 4, followed it by another 4. So these are symmetry operations happening in tandem one after the other, I would get a twofold rotation. So for this square, I not only have a four-fold rotation, I also have a two-fold rotation, uh, two-fold axis of rotation, all right? Uh, likewise, I can have three-fold axis of rotation, six-fold axis of rotations for polygons as well, all right? So I hope uh, th this idea is clear. Now, if I were to take this, Uh, if I were to take, oh, okay, sorry. Let me take a square lattice in two dimensions. So there is a four-fold axis of rotation on each lattice point. There is a four-fold axis of rotation here, a four-fold axis of rotation here, four-fold axis of rotation here. There is also a four-fold axis of rotation at the middle of each square in the plane. So there are many four-fold axis of rotation. There are, additional, there are additional rotation elements like mirror planes as well, but we're not going to talk about them for a minute. So let me redraw this square lattice. Many four-fold axis of rotation. And by the way, when I talk about lattices in this fashion, I assume that they're infinite dimensional, that they go from infinity to infinity. They span the entire screen. All right. So now I have this part, this, uh, these points, this lattice. Let's place a motif on this uh, lattice. And the motif that I choose is a square. So I put a square on each point. I generate a two dimensional crystal, which has a square lattice and the motif is a square as well. Now I generate a crystal or a pattern. Does this pattern have a four fold axis of rotation at each lattice point? So I'm expecting some answers. 
yes if it spans the entire space then it should have an aggregate yes exactly by the way we uh, <laughs> we skipped five because in two dimensions there is no five fold axis of rotation it cannot completely fill up the entire space that is available there will be gaps so unless we talk about some quasi crystals we do not have five dimensional axis of rotation in two dimensions neither in three all right okay now let's look at this example of a hexagonal grid of points like what you see in graphene for example now in in this hexagonal grid in the exact geometric center of three lattice points you have a three fold axis of rotation okay and on each lattice point you have a six fold axis of rotation okay so you can have a grid or a lattice in which you have a three fold axis of rotation and six fold axis of rotation and they are not co-located they are not located at the same point all right is all of this making sense any questions my video might have stopped but nevertheless any questions my friends now let's look at these examples here uh, in 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 this example we have a square grid of points and we have a four dimensional axis of rotation at the exact geometric center we place square square bases elements square motifs we preserve this four fold axis of rotation however if we add rectangular elements to the lattice we uh, let go of the four fold axis of rotation and are only left with a two fold axis of rotation at the geometric center and if you if our motifs were triangles rectangular uh, sorry regular equilateral triangles very regular still if you put these axis of these basis elements on the lattice points you will let go of the two fold axis of rotation and you will be left with a one fold axis of rotation which is really no symmetry at all so this is the least symmetry that you can have a one fold axis of rotation that is you have to rotate by 360 degrees to achieve a symmetry operation now this is an interesting example if you were to put hexagons hexagonal motifs on each lattice point then you will get a two fold axis of rotation in between the lattice points okay so you can get many nice examples many uh, really nice examples of axial symmetry elements now let's come to our second kind of symmetry elements so i hope you do recognize that the symmetry element is an axis of rotation and the symmetry operation is a rotation an end fold rotation about that symmetry axis uh, so let's now move on to planes but i would say if i if you allow me to restart the video let's take a 3 or 4 minute break i'll just restart the video uh, and then we can uh, resume so i'm going to uh, pause the recording for a minute and we'll reconvene in 3 or 4 minutes all right so are you with me can you hear me guys yes sir here yes sir okay good okay so now we're going to talk about the second kind of symmetry element and associated with each symmetry element is a symmetry operation as well hello okay you can see me now the symmetry element that i would like to talk about is a plane of reflection also called a mirror and is its international notation it's denoted by m so what is m 
M is so we all know what a mirror what a mirror operation is. So let me give you an example here. So by the way, I've uploaded this document on the on the website. All right. So a mirror operation here. Here it is is being denoted by this blue line. And this blue line is showing a mirror plane that is coming out of the plane of the paper. And I have an object, some object here, a polygon here, which is being reflected. A lattice here, which is being reflected. Another motif here, which is being reflected. Okay, so far so good. And Uh, another thing that is really important to understand is the following. Okay, let me let me first of all give you some more examples. Suppose I have. Let's move back to our notebook. Suppose I have a square lattice. And I do know that there is a two-fold axis of rotation in the geometric center of the square lattice. Okay, so far so good. But I also recognize that there is a mirror, a two-dimensional mirror, a mirror plane that bisects the two lattice points. And the combination of this two-fold axis of rotation and the mirror uh, also necessitates that I have another mirror plane, which is orthogonal to the first mirror plane. Okay. So now this combination of two mirror planes and a two-fold axis of rotation, this set of symmetry elements could be written as 2, M and M. Okay. By the way, if I only have two mirror planes like this, then it necessitates the presence of a two, two fold axis of rotation. So the presence of some symmetry elements in a particular combination lead naturally to another symmetry element. Therefore, this 2MM in many cases is all, only written by MM because it necessitates the presence of a two-fold axis of rotation. Okay, so now if I were to take this mirror plane, uh, this sequence of points, and I wanted to place squares on them, like this, okay? I immediately recognize that there is a two-fold axis of rotation, and I immediately recognize that there is a mirror plane here, and there is a mirror plane here. If I were to take this two-dimensional lattice and replace the square motifs with rectangular motifs, do I have a two-fold axis of rotation here? Yes, I do. And do I have a mirror plane here? Yes, I do. And do I have a mirror plane here? Yes, I do. In this particular example that I've drawn on the left, <clears throat> are there any additional mirror planes that exist? Are, are, are these the, mirror plane, the diagonal ones, right? So I have a mirror, I also have a mirror plane here in this example, and I have a mirror plane here. So I have instead of two, I have four mirror planes. And that means that this axis of rotation, and, and that is because the axis of rotation here is more than a two-fold axis of rotation. It's a four-fold axis of rotation. Okay, yes, so let me redraw this everything again. I have a four-fold axis of rotation here. And that four-fold axis of rotation has created these additional diagonal mirror planes. 
हमसे रेक्टेंगुलर वाले में भी तो डायगोनल नहीं हो भी तो सकता है ना हो भी सकता है नहीं भी हो सकता <coughs> यहां पे तो नहीं है देखने से लग रहा है कि इसमें भी डायगोनल हम कट कर सकते हैं अगर मैंने इस तरह बनाया कि लग रहा है लेकिन है नहीं है और राइट सर ठीक है अच्छा अब हम Now let's move to the third kind of symmetry element. So we'll we'll talk a lot about mirror planes, uh, but now let me recount the kind of symmetry elements we've talked about. We've talked about axes of rotation at one fold, two fold, three fold, four fold, six fold axes of rotation. These are also called proper rotations, by the way. And we have a mirror plane. So the first five are axial rotations the sec the sixth one is a is a plane rotation and the third kind of operation acts about a point and this is called a center of symmetry or an inversion operation so and this is denoted by one and i put a bar on top of it now what does this mean this means the following if i identify a center of inversion and i have some objects i have an object here i have an object here a point here what does this mean this means that i will connect this point to the center of symmetry and extend it to the other side and on the exact diametrically opposite side i will have another point so the inverted image of this point a is a prime the inverted image of this point b let's draw where it is i connect b with the center of symmetry with the inversion center extend it to the other side and put a point on the exact same distance on the other side likewise i do this for c as well i connect c with the center of symmetry and i <coughs> extend it to the other side and put a point over here c c prime so this polygon that i can draw has a center of symmetry okay so this kind of operation is called an inversion operation and why is it is labeled it is labeled as one one bar or bar one because it is a one fold rotation followed by inversion okay and a uh, another really important point is that crystals that have a center of symmetry of this kind which have a point of inversion they are called centrosymmetric crystals and these cent these centrosymmetric crystals have certain physical properties and non centrosymmetric crystals have certain physical properties so if spatial inversion is broken if there is no center of symmetry we say that spatial symmetry sorry we say that spatial symmetry is broken and we need to break spatial symmetry if we would like to see certain interesting physical properties such as ferroelectricity or piezoelectricity etc so the breaking of symmetry or spatial inversion is really important for the manifestation of certain physical properties by the way a really important example of if you look at my uh, screen here if i take two of my hands okay and i put one palm in front of you and the other the back of my hand in front of you then if i draw a line between these two thumbs the exact center of that 
line will be a center of symmetry. So I can rotate my hands like this. You will find that the two hands form a centrosymmetric pair. And there is, uh, there is a center of symmetry or an inversion center uh, in this example of hands. Okay. So the hands, the human body is centrosymmetric and the hands present a really good example for that. Okay. So mathematically, what the center of inversion means in two dimensions is that a point x, y in two dimensions is transformed under an inversion operation to minus x and minus y. And I can extend this to three dimensions as well. A three-dimensional center of symmetry makes a point x, y, z go to minus x, minus y, and minus z. Okay. So now in total, in two dimensions, I have these seven symmetry elements. Okay. All right. Any questions? Because now we have to move on to three dimensions. Sir. Yes. So symmetry ke liye, uh, sab se basic condition kya hai ke we should have a, a center of symmetry because otherwise to higher object ka hi one fold symmetry to exist karti hi hai. If you have to 360 rotate karne to you should get the same object. But ye one fold symmetry nahi hai. Ye one bar hai. Ye one fold symmetry ke baad ek inversion bhi ho rahi hai. Nahin, waise mein ek, ek random object ki baat kar raha for uh, symmetry, ke liye, sabse important condition to ye na ki there should exist some uh, center of symmetry ke, jiske round up usko rotate karenge. Nahin. Uh, aisi baat nahi hai. Yani plane hai. The plane is not a rotation about an axis. The, these elements here, these five elements here are defined by a line or an axis. Okay? This element M is not defined by a line. It's defined by a plane. This element is defined by a point. There is a point in space about which objects are referenced to. So on one side of this point, there are objects and there is the centrosymmetric pair on the other side. <coughs> okay, so you have axial elements, you have a plane element and you have a point element. Okay, so... So, if any of these elements are present, the object has it has some symmetry. And if nothing is present, it still has one fold symmetry. Okay, it still has this one fold symmetry here. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Sir. See. All right. So these are the seven symmetry elements that we have in two dimensions. And when we move on to three dimensions, all these symmetry elements they hold, they, they still exist. There is a two fold, there's a three fold, a one fold, four fold, six fold axis rotation. I draw, suppose I draw a cube. Now this is a lattice, a square cube, uh, sorry, a square la lattice or a cubic lattice. We're going to talk more about this. But these lines I've drawn only for the visual guide. So there are really points over here. So if I look at this object, there is a four-fold axis of rotation that passes through the center of this object, right? There is a four-fold axis of rotation that goes like this. Okay, and then there is also uh, a four-fold axis of rotation that is coming out of the plane of the paper, correct? So there are four, then there is a mirror plane in the exact middle of this. Now let me redraw this. 
let me redraw the mirror planes on a separate so i've identified the four fold axis of rotation now let me redraw the mirror planes there's a mirror plane here halfway height wise there is a mirror plane halfway depth wise And there is a mirror plane halfway lengthwise. Okay. So there are mirror planes, there are axes of rotation for three dimensions as well. By the way, interestingly, if I were to draw this cube. <coughs> Can you identify a three-fold axis of rotation in this cube? Is there any three-fold axis of rotation? Any ideas? Yes, sir, from the diagonal point. Say the diagonal. Say. Body diagonal or face diagonal? Uh, sir, its the point diagonal, that is, one point from the corner. Which yeah, corner? Which corner? On the opposite side, the last one, upper. नीचे के ऊपर 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 पीछे वाला ये वाला यस राइट सो इफ आई वर टू ड्रॉ दिस बॉडी डायगोनल दिस इज कॉल्ड अ बॉडी डायगोनल दिस इज अ थ्री फोल्ड एक्सिस ऑफ रोटेशन ओके लाइकवाइज आई कैन ड्रॉ दिस बॉडी डायग ओप सॉरी सॉरी हाथ कप 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 आ जाता है कभी-कभी So this is a three-fold axis of rotation, and there's another three-fold axis of rotation comes out here. Okay, so it becomes difficult to draw. So all the body diagonals there are, there are four three-fold axis of rotation. The four body diagonals, each one of them is a three-fold axis of rotation. All right. So this these symmetry elements that we've already talked about they also carry over to three dimensions. Okay. However, there are additional symmetry elements. Okay. Let me identify those. Suppose I were to draw. Excuse me. Uh, sir, we also have more planes of symmetry. I guess. So diagonal reflection जो सकती हैं. हाँ वो उनका जिक्र करेंगे भी उनको ग्लाइड प्लेन्स कहते हैं ओके सो लेट मी फॉर द सेक ऑफ ईज ऑफ टाइम लेट मी गिव यू रेडी मेड एग्जाम्पल हेयर ओके लुक एट दिस एग्जाम्पल हेयर I've drawn a pattern. So this is a pattern here. Look at this point here, this blue point here. Okay, so I've placed atoms or motifs which are just single atoms on each lattice point, and this is a kind of a rectangular uh, lattice. Uh, it's called orthorhombic. We'll learn more about this. So a point is here which i have represented as blue even though the blue is not different from the red all these points are the same so if i were to do a four fold axis four fold rotation about this yellow line here so this is really a four fold axis of rotation okay four fold axis of rotation which means i drew a 90 degree rotation about this axis and then i do an inversion operation and the in center of inversion is the exact geometric center of this cuboid i will 
create a point here which is shown in purple which i've now over over colored into green okay so this rectangular cuboid which has atoms at all the eight corners has a, of course it has a fourfold axis of rotation but it also has a fourfold axis of rotation followed by a center of inversion okay so this is called a roto inversion or a four bar operation all right so i can have in three dimensions i can have what are called roto inversions can you repeat the concept all right <laughs> a roto inversion is a, a proper rotation followed by an inversion or an inversion followed by a, a proper rotation so if i look at the example over here i do a four fold a 90 degree rotation of this entire object okay what's going to happen let me draw it. let me draw what's going to happen i have this cuboid i do a rotation about this four fold axis of rotation what this does is it takes this blue point this blue point to this location so a moves to a prime okay now in addition to uh, this symmetry element suppose i have a center of inversion here here excuse me this is my center of inversion now if i were to invert a prime across this center of inversion i will end up where do i end up i end up here right b prime or a double prime yes sir so if i were to have all eight of these points populated then this pattern that i've drawn this crystal that i've drawn also has a roto inversion uh, axis which means a four fold rotation followed by a center of inversion so this is what is meant by a roto inversion so not only are proper rotations in, in uh, allowed improper rotations are also allowed which are roto inversion operation so i can have a one fold one bar two bar three bar four bar and six bar operation so a four bar operation i've already exemplified a three bar operation is a three fold rotation followed by a center of inversion a two fold rotation followed by a center of inversion okay but this one bar we've already seen so this is nothing new in three dimension we've already seen a one bar uh, center of inversion operation in two dimension so it carries over to two dimensions the two bar operation let's let's look at the two bar operation sorry my something is going on with my with my pen over here So let's look at a two two bar rotation. <clears throat> Suppose I have. Let me redraw. Let me draw a square. In fact, a cube in three dimensions. Since we're talking about three dimensions. So if I were to take a point over here, and if I were to define a two fold axis of rotation in the geometric center of this cube where will this point a end up can anyone 
can anyone identify where will this point a end up if i were to do a two fold rotation or a 180 degree rotation about this axis of rotation sir so on the, the opposite diagonal diagram. side of the upper face here here uh, right i can't uh, no sir it's it's ugly wale point well, uh, either yep yes right exactly so this is a prime this is the impact of a two fold rotation on on this point now if i had a center of inversion in the exact geometric center of this cube and i were to do an inversion operation where will this point a prime end up so right below so, where the a was right here okay so it will end up here a so what's the relationship between a and a prime is there a symmetry operation that relates a with a prime Yes, sir. Two fold rotation. Two fold rotation. Sir, a reflection would where to. Reflection about a mirror plane. Mirror. A double prime case of rotation. And that mirror plane is perpendicular to uh, the two fold axis. So the two prime is really equal to a mirror plane. So two prime is nothing new. The only three new elements that. pop up in three dimensions are the three bar four bar and six bar roto inversion operations or improper rotations okay so <laughs> so a two fold axis of rotation and a mirror plane perpendicular to it is also equal to uh so whenever you have a two fold rotation followed by a one bar operation this is equivalent to a two fold rotation followed by a mirror plane perpendicular to the two fold rotation and this is what this symbol means a mirror plane perpendicular to the two fold axis of rotation okay but this is a slightly technical point you don't need to remember this hence we have generated three new symmetry elements and their axial symmetry elements because they are defined by a rotation even though it's a rotation followed by a center of inversion operation and these are three bar four bar and six bar so now we have 10 symmetry elements uh, in total we have 1 2 3 4 6 we have one bar we have m which is the same as 2 bar and then we have 3 bar 4 bar 6 bar but i would like to highlight one important point about about mirror operations suppose i have i draw a mirror plane and i have an object now this mirror plane is perpendicular to the screen if i draw straight lines or dashed lines or corrugated lines they represent mirror planes that are perpendicular to the screen mirror planes that are in the plane of the screen in international notation they are denoted by this right angle that i've drawn here okay so this is a mirror plane perpendicular to the screen now i have some object here okay and i put a plus sign with it now i'm going to show you some of the international notation which is used by crystallographers because this is important if you want to understand space group tables now the reflection of this object will be on the other side of the mirror plane no doubt will it be above the plane of the paper so if plus represents something that is slightly above the plane of the paper will will the mirror image be above or below the plane of the of the screen below why below something that is above remains above so this mirror plane is vertical it's perpendicular to the screen so something that remains above remains above yes sir the positive bhi hoga okay so yes, it's going to be positive it's going to be positive however is the mirror image of an object the same as the object can you shake hands with your with your image in the mirror yes sir it's relatively inverted 
sorry what, what is it literally inverted literally inverted okay that's a good good phrase but uh, it it's not the it's not the exact object in fact it's the an antimer of the original object or is the chiral image so if you stand in front of a mirror and you extend your right hand and you would like to shake hands with your alter ego with your mirror self the your alter ego or what you, your image will extend its left hand all right so this is what is meant by an, an antimorphism so the object and its mirror image they are an, an antimorphs of one another they are chiral isomers of one another okay so we really need to keep this a uh, concept uh, in our mind so uh, let me give you more examples of this okay this is a pretty image okay this is a nice cartoon that i've taken from a from an important book from the 1970s and now if you look at image a image a really represents a mirror plane okay so you have a mirror plane and an object here if it is above the plane of the paper it remains above the plane of the paper but it's the object the object on the other side is it's an entire morph b represents sorry b represents a two fold axis of rotation that's it so this is just a two fold axis of rotation okay so there are two people holding their hands and if you look at them from above this is what they look like so you do a two fold rotation and you get this arrangement c on the other hand let's look at c uh, if you look at c from the top if you look at it from the top this is what you will observe you will see a mirror plane this is a mirror plane okay and this is a mirror plane all right now if you were to draw this in crystallographic notation this entire arrangement in crystallographic notation what you would do is you would have two mirror planes and you just draw an object in one of the quadrants that is formed here put a plus sign with it okay. so if i consider this mirror plane here the image of this object reflected in the mirror plane a will be the same object with the plus sign because everything is a, that is above remains above but you get an enantiomer here of the original if you were to take a mirror image of this object which i've just drawn into the mirror plane b i will get the enantiomer of the enantiomer which is the original the plus sign and if i were to take the mirror image of this object that i've just drawn across a i will get the enantiomer here so this arrangement in c in crystallographic notation is generally drawn in tables and handbooks and uh, and what not by by the symbol so this symbolism that is drawn here represents all the symmetry operations so there are two mirror planes and it also represents the action of these symmetry operations on an object the object is now drawn by a circle with a plus sign okay so now this image that has been drawn over here this thing sir in fourth quadrant wouldn't the plus be below no uh. the plus not below the plus i mean something that is above i can draw the plus anywhere i mean plus is just a is just a symbol this just a nomenclature it just is a label for the object 
okay sir uh, sir can you kindly explain again what the plus is for okay so the plus means if this is my horizontal plane forget about middle plane this is my horizontal plane and there's an object that is above this plane okay i could put a plus with it just to show that i'm drawing something above the plane now if this were a mirror plane an m and i were to take the image of this object in this mirror plane i will get an object below this mirror plane okay and it will be the an entire morph of the original so the plus and minus sign represent whether the object that i've drawn is above the screen above the plane or below the plane okay now if i were to represent this in two dimensions what they do in a crystallographic tables is they draw a mirror plane the mirror plane as you know is now represented by since it's in the plane of the screen it's represented by this this right angle here and i draw an object half of the ob uh, and since the object and its in and time of the mirror image will coincide in position and i need to draw that so what i would do i would take a circle split it into half and half i would put a plus sign with it and half i would put a negative sign with it and then i put a comma in the in one half okay which is really a depiction of the scenario that i have drawn over here okay so plus sign when i draw plus sign with an object it represents something above the plane of the paper or the screen and when it comes with a negative sign it shows the same thing below the plane of the paper or the screen and sir in the figure that we were discussing why didn't you put a negative sign uh, there because, because i didn't put a negative sign because in this example uh, if you observe the mirror planes a and b they are vertical they are not horizontal <laughs> <laughs> so the mirror planes themselves are out of the plane of the paper they are perpendicular to the screen so something that remains above remains above if i had a horizontal mirror plane something that remains above goes below okay uh, all right sir yes now if i look at d here d is represented by a three fold axis of rotation so i have a three fold axis of rotation okay and anything that i just i could just draw just for my convenience these three lines here an object that remains above remains above and there there are no mirror planes here okay so i just remove these okay likewise i have some some nomenclature for figure f and some nomenclature for figure e figure e by the way is just um, a center of symmetry there's just a inversion center here so if i were to draw a figure for this this would be a, an object a center of symmetry one bar followed by an object which is its an entire morph and one is below and the other is above or one is above and the other is below so this scenario is represented in crystallographic notation by this image that i've drawn over here all right so let's move on uh, i've talked about uh, most symmetry elements but there are two symmetry elements some symmetry elements that 
are yet to be discussed. Uh, and we'll take this up in our next lecture. In our next lecture, we're going to finish our discussion of symmetry elements. So far, we've looked at one, two, three, four, six. We've looked at two bar, which is M. We've also looked at one bar. Then in three dimensions, we have three bar, four bar, and six bar. And now what we would like to see is two additional symmetry elements. By the way, all of these symmetry elements here, if you notice, all of them, they involve rotations. Okay. So this, these, these are proper rotations. This is the rotation followed by a center of inversion. This is a center of inversion. And three bar, four bar, six bar are improper rotations, which means proper rotations followed by center of inversion. Okay, so all of them revolve, involve rotations and no translations are involved. So these symmetry elements, how many are they? They are one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. These symmetry elements, they all of them <laughs> involve axes, and all of these axes pass through a point. So they are called point operations as well. And we can lump them together into sets and form what are called point groups. So in the next lecture, we're going to talk about additional symmetry elements, translational elements. And we're going to see that this set of point operations, they are supplemented by some translational elements to give you 26 different kinds of symmetry elements. We'll talk a little bit about point groups. And we'll also introduce the crystal, the seven crystal systems and hopefully the 14 Brave lattices as well. All right, so any questions? Uh, things will get clearer in the next lecture as well. Uh, would you like to ask anything here? Uh, sir, are these point groups the same as the chemists use like the D and C point groups, D2 and all those groups? Exactly, they are the same. Okay, sir. All right, folks. So thank you very much. Uh, inshallah, we'll meet uh, on next Tuesday. Uh, and do visit our website. The TA for this course has changed because Varda got busy in something else. The TA for this course is now Muzamil Shah. Uh, his email address is also on the website. <coughs> so, inshallah, see you on Tuesday then. Khuda Hafiz.